Fine. <laughs> Great to see you. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming. Panelists, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and over to you. Great. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, very nice to be back again. Um, I'll get straight into it um, with this topic, New Evidence the MDGs and the Role of Budget Support. What I wanted to do in very, very briefly was just have one slide on the context in which we are now operating, certainly as seen from the European Commission's perspective. Uh, secondly, just have uh, a couple of comments about the NDG contract, which Marcus has already mentioned and which I understand there's a fair bit of interest in. But then spend most of the time looking at this study that we have produced, looking at the linkage between budget support and MDG performance. So just some of the context, certainly from the Commission's perspective, budget support has been rising quite significantly um, as commitments from 15% earlier early, early this decade to 30% last year, and uh, it touched 40% in 2008 when the new EDF10 programs were being, uh, were being committed. But we're also very conscious that budget support uh, is perhaps under greater scrutiny and more critical scrutiny than it has been for, for some time. We're conscious that a number of our uh, more influential member states are, are raising concerns, uh, particularly around political governance issues. Uh, the European Court of Auditors is becoming uh, perhaps more critical than it has been about the Commission's approach and in particular the rigour with which it assesses and monitors eligibility for budget support. The European Parliament itself has been quite responsive in the past to Court of Auditors uh, commentaries and is also quite responsive to, to voices from, um, from the NGOs whose views have been quite mixed. Oxfam in particular have been supportive but we know that that, that viewpoint, viewpoints are quite quite diverse across the NGO spectrum. And from our partner countries' point of view, uh, who many of whom have been strong enthusiasts for budget support, they certainly see the advantages compared with more traditional uh, aid, I think a number are becoming, perhaps because of the scrutiny and concerns that are being expressed, themselves a bit more conscious of the risks attached to budget support as well as the benefits. So that's the context in which we're operating. Oh, and I should finish, yes, part of the Part of the problem, I think, is the difficulties we have had in collecting and disseminating and communicating evidence around budget support, which is what, in part, the study was seeking to, to try and address. On the MDG contract, um, I'll scamper through this very quickly, but in brief, it is a longer term, more predictable form of budget support, still focused on MDG results or MDG related indicators and targeted at strong performers was introduced by the Commission in 2009, effectively. Uh, just very briefly, um, a longer-term commitment horizon, six years as opposed to the more traditional three for a Commission budget support programme. Less conditional in that the base tranche, the fixed tranche that the Commission provides is essentially linked to the core eligibility criteria uh, only. And more predictable. I won't explain the full mechanics of the arrangement at this point in time, but essentially the combination of a larger fixed share, a small annual performance tranche, and a deferred response to our assessments of performance against MDG-related indicators means that our annual disbursements are or should be provided with a very high degree of, of certainty. It is still an instrument of, of budget support. That much needs to be emphasised, around which there are eligibility criteria set out um, in the various legal frameworks governing commission support, and that needs to be borne in mind. For those of you who like pretty pictures, if you imagine an assessment of the effectiveness of budget support, and you can think of the, the classic approach to budget support under the ninth EDF period, these innovations in the way we provide the MDG contract ideally would be improving the effectiveness of budget support as an instrument. What is worth noting is that as we develop the MDG contract, I think some of the elements of its design have also been incorporated into the classic budget support that the Commission provides, with less conditionality attached to the, the, the fixed tranche allocation. Um, a, a process of monitoring performance where we assess performance, <coughs> previous year's performance this year, to determine next year's payments, which increases predictability. And in a number of countries, a higher fixed and a smaller variable tranche. Um, essentially, launched in eight countries uh, last year. Uh, 1.8 billion euros altogether, accounting for half of all the general budget support provided uh, by the Commission to the ACP countries under the 10th EDF. Uh, and last year, um, essentially everything that we had expected to spend was spent. Now, the Commission is trying to move away from uh, our focus on inputs and the impacts that we're having 
Well, the bottom line is that it's perhaps too soon to tell. We will have mid-contract reviews taking place uh, in early 2011, but at this point in time, I think we, you know, we have ground for some encouragement with the way in which the NDG contract is proceeding. Let me move on to the, 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 the main part of the presentation, where we look at the study looking at budget support and NDG performance, and I should... I should acknowledge the great help and uh, contribution that Andrew Dusu, who is a stagiaire research assistant that came into DG Dev and worked with me on this, did a lot of the, the, the number crunching. So if you're watching, Andra, thank you very much. Um, but uh, this is very much a, a joint product. The context I've, I've really already, already outlined, the purpose of the study was to try and enhance our evidence base in terms of the relationship between budget support on the one hand and NDG performance on the, on the other. I want to say a little bit about some of the literature that, we've, that we reviewed. I'll go a little bit more detail into the methodology and the, and the key results, and then have a few concluding comments at the, at the end. Um, in terms of the literature review, what do we know already about the linkage between budget support and, and MDGs? A lot of the analysis of MDG performance, I guess many of you will be familiar with, makes the point that globally on track, but many countries will miss most MDGs. A lot of emphasis on the geographical disparities, not a whole lot of discussion about the role of different aid instruments in terms of countries' likelihood of achieving uh, the, the MDGs. Um, the budget support evaluation literature itself, uh, many of you, I think, will be familiar with the OECD DAC evaluation that was, uh, that was published in 2006. Um, and that's still used as a benchmark, as a reference point by many donor organisations looking at budget support. And I think the, the main points are, are probably fairly familiar to you. Um, it's been a relevant response to acknowledge problems in aid effectiveness, uh, an effective, efficient and sustainable way of supporting national poverty reduction strategies, it supported harmonisation and alignment, it strengthened government ownership and accountability, positive effects on allocative and operational efficiency of public expenditure, it's improved access to services, although question marks about the quality in some cases. Broadly positive findings, <coughs> probably strongest in Uganda, where the duration and scale of budget support has been, um, has been greatest. But I think the basic problems of attribution, um, to what extent is budget, res budget support responsible for this, and the counterfactual, could we have achieved as much with other instruments, they remain quite hard to address, and the evaluation was... Uh, was not able to take us so far in that particular area. There's a second round of evaluations with a new methodology being piloted which will hopefully address uh, some of those, those, those concerns. In terms of other literature, uh, quite a few studies looking at particular features of budget support. Um, Oxfam produced a study looking at a, a smaller set of countries. The Commission itself has often referred to individual countries receiving large amounts of budget support and indicated how well they have performed on a number of indicators. And while very useful these more anecdotal illustrations are, they are just that. And we were quite surprised that something more systematic had not been, been done, which is what the study is seeking to do. One third other third strand of literature worth mentioning. Um, quite a lot of, indeed a huge, industry evolved around the assessment of aid and growth. Uh, complex econometric analyses. First round of study seemed to suggest that aid was not particularly effective. I think Paul, you coined mm -hmm. the macro-micro paradox expression. Uh, sort of second generation of studies, Burnside and Dollar, suggested that actually aid is effective, but only when the policy environment is good. Hansen and Tarp and a raft of others saying, actually, that's not true. Aid works anyway. Um, other people suggesting, no, it doesn't. Point is, very contested, very controversial, and, and the debate still goes on. What was so interesting, to me at any rate, was that very, very few of those studies themselves try and differentiate between different types of, of aid instrument. We only found two in reality. One, an, an early IMF study drawing on the Burnside and Dollar work, which essentially confirmed their finding that budget support has a bigger effect on growth in the presence of good policies, a bigger effect than projects, um, but a worse effect in the presence of, of poor policies. And there was a more recent study by Uttara and Strobel, which disaggregated aid into different component parts. That, however, suggested that project aid was perhaps more effective than, uh, than program aid. 
uh, but they themselves said, uh, acknowledged the limitations of their analysis and cautioned against concluding in favour of projects as a consequence. I think the bottom line is that the, you know, the, the case study based evidence says very little about the impact of budget support on our ultimate indicators of interest. Certainly not to allow us to make some comparative uh, or comprehensive analyses. The cross country regression <coughs> analysis is just is both limited and, and contradictory. Um, and we thought it would be worthwhile doing a more systematic review of the linkage between budget support and MDG performance. It's not an evaluation. It's not a sophisticated econometric analysis, uh, but we uh, just wanted to see what linkage we could identify between the provision of budget support and improvements in key MDG indicators of interest. So, um, the approach we took was to uh, draw on the OECD DAC database for aid and the UN data set for uh, four MDGs, looking at primary enrollments, gender parity, uh, uh, child mortality and access to water. We also looked at the Human Development Index. The budget support data covers general budget support only. There is no, as yet, sector budget support indicator uh, in, the, in the DAC database. Um, <coughs> and the GBS data, in fact, only applies certainly for disbursements from, from 2002. Um, we effectively calculated budget support ratios as a share of ODA in total and as a share of GDP for each country and averaged that over the 2002 to 2007 period. Over that same period, wherever the data permitted us to do so, we looked at the absolute change in the value of our MDG indicators of interest. And then for those countries where we had the MDG data, we simply ranked our budget support recipients according to the amount of budget support they had received and divided them into low, medium and high um, uh, groups of three thirds. And then assess to what extent could we see if high budget support recipients perform better than low budget support recipients and undertook some, uh, some fairly modest statistical analysis as well. Just a couple of basic statistics worth pointing out. This shows the, our GBS data and I just wanted to draw your attention to two points. First of all, disbursements typically are half the quoted data for commitments, so we're still falling well short of where we should be at in terms of being predictable with our commitments. The second point is that in aggregate, uh, if you look at the top line, those, those numbers are still pretty small. You know, we're looking at 5% of ODA being provided as GBS, 1% um, uh, of GBS as a percentage of GDP. But its support is not a big deal for the majority of donors, and certainly in aggregate. And the third point is that it's actually quite the distribution of countries to which receive budget support is quite skewed. More than half, whether we're looking at all countries, the ACP region or Africa, more than half receive either no or very little budget support. And then you have a, a long tail with some receiving quite large amounts. Just a, a, bit, of, a bit of background. Um, turning to the results, I began with the ACP countries, partly because that's the area which historically DG Dev and the Commission has focused on. It's also the area which receives the lion's share of commission budget support. It's also the area where budget support flows are our largest and most variable and where we hope to find the, the clearest results. Essentially what this shows is that for our five indicators of interest, the high budget support countries do appear to perform better um, and in some cases substantially so than low budget support recipients. Look at the first one, change in net primary, primary enrollment. High budget support countries uh, witnessed a, a, a nine percentage point improvement. Low budget support countries just a one percentage point improvement. Uh, similarly for the education uh, gender disparity ratio. The child mortality rates, um, that, that implies a reduction. So the higher figure for the high budget support countries, the difference is less, is less uh, obvious, but still perform better than low budget support countries. The t-test was just a, a uh, uh, an estimate of the significance, how different, how statistically significant, how statistically different are our results for the two samples. The lower the number, the better. Um, so uh, statistically not significant in the case of 4.1 or 7.8, but strongly so for the other three indicators. Um, 
this sh essentially shows the same information in graphical form with the medium set of countries. The two charts on the left are uh, indicators 2.1 and 3.1, and you can see more clearly the, the fairly smooth trend. High budget support recipients perform better than low budget support recipients. Top right is the child mortality indicator. Um, not quite such a smooth line. The medium countries, however, on average receive only 2% of ODA as budget support. So in terms of the volumes of budget support they receive, they're pretty close to the low budget support country. The access to water indicator, 7.8, the pattern is not so not, not so um, not so clear cut. Um, just briefly, the this chart looks at percentage. The top left looks at percentage changes in indicator rather than absolute changes. Basically, shows the same kind of pattern. We thought absolute changes were a more useful indicator because, take um, primary enrolments as an example, uh, improving from 50 to 55 ought to be easier than improving from 90 to 95. Uh, a percentage change would make that um, uh, would make the 90 to 95 improvement appear less when in fact it would be a, a more significant achievement. Even just looking at absolute changes, we're not really capturing the starting point. Um, the scatter diagrams <coughs> don't look brilliant. Uh, quite a few outliers which, which affect the results. When we actually look at the correlations and their formal test of significance, we essentially find that the the, there does appear to be a, a significant correlation, certainly using the Spearman's coefficient, which looks at ranks and therefore diminishes the effects of some of the outliers, for uh, two education indicators and for the Human Development Index, uh, less significant for uh, child mortality and, and water. Let me scamper on through. For, for Africa, um, broadly similar results, although in this case the child mortality rate appears less good in the high budget support recipients than the low budget support recipients, although not significantly so. Um, if we look across uh, all developing countries, here uh, a, a more clear-cut picture emerges with the high budget support recipients performing better than the low budget support recipients, and in every case significantly so. Well, so far so good, you might say, but so what, you might also say. This is just looking at an association, and there are plenty of reasons why you might anticipate such an association. To the extent that budget support is targeted, for example, at low-income countries, where because their initial, their starting point is less good, you might expect them to perform better, you might expect there to be uh, a positive association. Um, if all our, our arguments around the aid effectiveness agenda are correct, we would expect there to be a positive association. So in this further analysis, we just sought to try and control for factors that might be explaining this positive association. We did this by uh, comparing our top third, this time with the bottom two thirds of, of the countries, uh, partly because in some cases uh, the, the, the bottom third still only received 0%, so we couldn't easily differentiate between the, the bottom third and the middle third. It won't affect the correlations, it does make it more demanding for there to be a significantly different result. In brief, what we found that was that when we just look at the low income countries, um, it is still the case that within our subset of low income countries, and this is now looking at all ODA recipients, high budget support recipients perform better than low budget support recipients, in every case except for, in this case, the, the water indicator. This matters because um, the majority of our budget support, our budget support is, is, is targeted at, at low income countries, so uh, it is helpful to understand this particular uh, ratio or um, bit, bit of evidence. The second point where one might expect there to be a good association is to the extent that we are targeting through budget support, because of the eligibility criteria that exist, better performing countries. Uh, which one might expect to perform better with respect to our MDGs, uh, our MDG indicators. But if we just look at our subset, the top half of countries rated by the, the CPIA, we still find that our high budget support countries perform better than our low budget support countries. Uh, in each of these cases, the statistical significance is, is weakened, um, and it remains the case that our water and um, uh, child mortality indicators are generally least strong. But the essential point appears to be uh, to be valid. 
The third set of results we're looking at more heavily aid-dependent countries, where again we find that um, the high budget support recipients perform better than the low budget support recipients by uh, varying factors and again with varying degrees of, of significance. But overall we thought these were um, controlling for these different variables um, added uh, some useful insight into the linkage between budget support and uh, MDG indicators of interest. One other piece of analysis which I'll just briefly touch on. We wanted to explore the extent to which there might have been changes before and, and after. I'll go through this, and, in fact I'll cut straight to this page because time is pressing. Um, whether we could see that as we increase the levels of budget support in our 1995 to 2002 period compared with 2002 to 2007, and in this context we're looking at commitment, not disbursement data, uh, whether we could see that as budget support increases, is there an acceleration in the rate of improvement in the NDGs? Hopefully you would see lines going from bottom left to top right on that chart. Uh, in three cases, uh, we do. Um, in the water one, we don't. In the HDI, uh, for reasons that I find surprising, I cannot explain, uh, we, do, we do not appear to find that indicator, uh, that, that, that result. I suspect it's something to do with the fact that just sustaining a rate of, a percentage rate of improvement is, is difficult as the absolute level improves, but um, I think one would have to conclude that the results there are a little bit more, more mixed. Time is running out, so let me just go to my, um, my last slide. Essentially, what we take the results to show is that high budget support recipients have indeed generally performed better than low budget support recipients, and often significantly so. The correlations are perhaps not particularly strong, certainly for child mortality and for water, although they're generally still significant for our education indices and for the Human Development Index. It may be that the water, um, uh, the relatively poor performance of the water indicator is because the data is less good, which is an argument some people have made to me, uh, that there's greater private provision of water supply. I'm not completely sure about that one. Uh, that the water sector is more dominated by um, by by project inputs um, and donor coordination around the sector is perhaps less strong. That's, that's a possibility. I'm not too sure. I'd be very interested in your own views. On the uh, child mortality, um, it may be that because we're looking at an under five mortality rate, by definition, when we're looking at contemporaneous changes in or, or flows of budget support and changes in the indicator, we're going to be limited to how much improvement we can see. It may also be that in an awful lot of our budget support recipient countries, basic levels of spending and on health are still below levels that many professionals would say is necessary to achieve systematic improvements in our, in our indicators. And we're still looking at outcome rather than output indicators. I'm not too sure. I'd be interested in your, in your own views on that. Um, the point about controlling for factors which, which one might expect to be partly responsible for a positive association uh, we found was, was an important result. Um, and the before and after analysis, a little bit mixed, not quite sure how best to e e explain that. Key conclusions to, to wrap up. The study is looking at association, not causality, and it's very clear that a range of factors will be in, involved in determining our um, improvements in, in MDG indicators of, of interest. The fact that the, the controlling for certain variables maybe gives us some grounds for optimism in terms of causality, but we're still not entirely sure which way round that flows. There's an interesting research question there still. I think there is some more analysis that could be done that could try and unpack that question, maybe looking at lagged effects. I think there's some more analysis that could be done trying to control for the initial level of some of our MDG indicators. I'm sure there's some interesting analysis that could be done trying to understand in specific countries why some perform better than others within a high budget support recipient group or within a low budget support recipient group why is there still such variation it's clear that there are other factors are at play um, but overall we were um, we were encouraged by the evidence that this particular study produced we hope it has filled a gap in the literature we were surprised ourselves that this appeared not to have been done before I very much stand to be corrected on that point from our panelists and from you in the audience but uh, thank you very much Thank you. <laughs>